present. Hello and welcome to another one of our discussions. A long and tedious discussion on something where someone is probably wrong on the internet. I can't wait to see the comments on this video. We live for the comments. <laughs> so leave, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Britain and the American Civil War. This is a topic that we've discussed quite a bit before, but we've never made our seminal video on the Trent Affair and what we think a potential third Anglo-American war would look like. So we're going to discuss Britain's involvement in the American Civil War and mostly focus around some analysis of the Trent Affair today. But in future, we're going to try to paint the picture of what we think an Anglo-American war would have looked like um, in, Dece in December of 1861, early 1862. And then we're also going to be talking about what an Anglo-American war might have looked like later on once America had um, truly gone on the war footing um, and, and compare those two different things. Yeah, there's things. definitely two different so, Indian armies at different times of the war. Absolutely. So today we're going to be discussing the Trent Affair, and as with most historical things, in order to discuss something, you have to back up quite a long time. Just a little bit. Just here, a little bit. Much. So we're going to start where everyone starts, at Fort Sumter. So this shots the, are fired. The, the point of no return. Yes, a bit. That's another video. A bit, a yeah. bit. So shots are fired at December Fort Sumter. 61. And um, in, in April of 61, right? So. And uh, we, I would say we at the wrong times, other European nations, Britain <laughs> included, um, had to make a choice of how to act, um, how to treat the different parties in the war. And that's something that a lot of people um, were loath to admit, that there are different parties. It's not just... Um, armed rebels yeah, in, it's, it's in more a single than a, country. Like a domestic insurrection. It's more than a city yeah. uh, uprising. It's very clear that there is a major war going yeah. on. Not exactly a modern war, but nonetheless a war. And public opinion aside, because everyone has an opinion on it, and, and a lot of other people are going to discuss the, the minutia of public opinion, um, if you really want an interesting read on it, the, the cause of all nations goes into the press war. Um, and even in um, uh, Central and Southern Europe, you have the, the, the press war going on. But there's two important things that happen for Britain. It's the declaration of belligerency status, and then following that with um, Queen Victoria's um, announcement about the Foreign Enlistment Act, which was previously an obscure act, but it put some very specific circumstances on the South. So the first, the first thing, the belligerency status. Do you want to talk about that? Which was May. Yeah. So, like you mentioned, that by this point, you can't ignore what's going on in the United States, um, especially for Britain, one of their largest trading partners, and uh, American commerce, whether it's cotton, manufactured goods, machinery, is essential. And already, there's you, you can see the foundation of the special relationship. Uh, you can't ignore what's going on in the United States. And so, the announcement of uh, an acknowledgement that there's two belligerents in a war by the British was not a recognition of either side. It wasn't an endorsement of either yeah. side. It was more of a, a uh, declaration of a pragmatic reality. So, yeah. and, and I think we can even agree today, like whether or not you agree that the Confederacy should have been an independent nation, we all know 
that was still a war. There yeah. were two sides. It was North, South, Blue, Gray, um, call them what you are, a rebellion. Um, it, a war was taking place. Yeah. So it's so the the thing that which that creates changed. a legal framework because yeah. now if you're a belligerent, you have certain rights. Yeah. And it also avoided some diplomatic incidents with um, if any British firms might have sold um, munitions or, or any sort of material to either power or either side, either belligerent, they now aren't automatically declaring war on the other side. Um, a lot of correspondence from the U.S. at the beginning of the war said if anything goes to the Confederacy, you are aiding armed rebels, that puts us in a difficult situation, if not a, a situation that would lead to war. And then it also, um, in terms of uh, delivering things through any potential um, blockade, now, now open up. And then that even is something that is worthy of discussion because the it's, British, yeah. they, they do not acknowledge that there is a blockade for some time. They say, just because you've declared a blockade doesn't mean it's a blockade in reality. And if you, if you don't actually have ships patrolling and you have two ships that are nominally guarding this area, if we get ships through, if, if civilian ships go through, that doesn't mean yeah. we've broken That's or blockaded. That's an old naval yeah. precedent of, of an actual yeah. effective, and effective is the word, it has yeah. to be effective. And we could go in the, into the weeds with the, the legal minutiae of this, which is it's still unclear. There's, historians still have different perspectives mm -hmm. on the legalities of all of this. Yeah. But I think if you were to broad brush paint it over, it, they came up with a pragmatic, realistic way of dealing with it. Like, uh, we're, so the British were still able to trade with North and South. Um, and it was a, a pragmatic workaround, so to speak. Um, now the other big step uh, before all this happens is the Foreign Enlistment Act. And that's uh, early 19th century, I think 1819, um, that forbids um, British citizens from enlisting or encouraging others to enlist in foreign militaries. And it also included uh, verbiage on the selling of arms and it made it clear that the British government does not sanction um, military support in any way. And so there might be, um, you know, dealings with firms, but it's all paints that legal gray area. Um, and it's very disappointing to the Confederate diplomats. It is, it is, um, I like to make the argument that one of the greatest mistakes of the Civil War was the people they chose to be the diplomats. Yancey yeah. is one of the worst choices. Who would you pick to put in a diplomatic situation? Would you pick the whiskey drinking, tobacco chewing, loudest person you know? <laughs> the British press is full in, in like the stereotypical American and they're already is willing to believe on the carpet things. yeah with this tobacco they're, that's like the, they're the uncouth Americans they're already willing to and believe then who shows up to represent yeah, them yeah yes <laughs> and he goes into these he gets Lord Russell who's the foreign minister uh, the foreign secretary um, actually grants them a meeting which is more than generous they've been waiting um, and Yancey demands recognition, among other things. There's the, the possible, there's the, you know, talk that maybe there could be um, uh, the abolition of slavery down the road, the denial that they, the slave trade will be reestablished. Um, and, and Yancey, from what I've read, goes into this diatribe about the Constitution, the American Constitution, 
and and uh, you know individual liberty to Lord Russell. It, it, it's a, a, a horrible comedic, it would have been great. I would love to have been a fly on the wall in that meeting. But it ends with a demand for recognition, which is flat, denied. Um, and so with the failures of that party, that's where we um, get Mason and Slidell are being respectively appointed to Britain and France. Um, and they... Uh, the, the Confederate government wants to send someone else because this is a big deal that they need oh, the, like the foreigners writing yeah. on it. Uh, now, the one thing that Yancey, before I, we move on from Yancey, the one thing he doesn't get introduced to a lot of polite society, he only gets introduced to two MPs, but he does get introduced to one very important MP, John Laird. And Laird is you know, will be very important in the war because Laird and Sons build some of the most Rams. important commerce raiders uh, for Birkenhead, the Confederacy. Birkenhead Rams, yep. which yep. we got to do a video on those. Yeah. Remind me, we got to do a yes. video on the Laird Rams. Yeah, but Laird, and Laird gets into his own legal trouble with <laughs> potentially violating the Foreign Enlistment Act, but if the, if the ship has gun ports but no guns in it, is it really a warship? Well, it's being built for the Khedive of Egypt. Yes, or the, the Italians. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the Florida, it's the Oretto. And we See, have the Italians to prove it. Uh, <laughs> which is a story for a different day. But good. We're already 10 minutes in and we haven't even... Yes, we haven't even got to the Trent Affair, but yeah. the, the premise of this is Britain, um, you know, everything hinges on foreign support, the current delegation from the Confederacy has more or less failed. And so... Diplomatically, they were very successful. It's, if, if you show up in England with a bag of gold, they've, they've made you some, walk away with a lot of guns. They've made some connections. Yeah. They've made some connections for, for material, but they need that diplomatic recognition. They've, either in France and in Britain, they have not been successful in making friends. So a new set of people has um, been appointed to... Who um, are distinctly more capable. They're more capable, but they're also but, obnoxious. Yeah, we made the point before, because when you read the history books there, you hear Mason and Slidell it's there. There's no context to the yeah. names, but they were prominent senators. Absolutely, antebellum. So we he we was he was the joke the, that it would be like uh, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer. Yeah, are everyone being knew sent overseas to represent yeah. us uh, with all their baggage and all of their yep. pr people uh, knew the, who the they political were political yeah. positions that they argued for. So yeah, Mason. Um, I believe Mason had been uh, president pro tempore of the Senate, um, had been a senator and then a congressman before that since the 1830s, um, and then Slidell had been also a, Was a he senator. The, the Mason of Mason Dixon? No, that's no. that's that's okay. the 18th century. But I'm sure they're all related, probably. But. Um, but they the, were the, the North was genuinely concerned. They were enough high profile. They they, they had enough um, you know, firepower, I guess, in their names that the the Union, when they heard that they had been appointed, like Minister Plymouth, Pin ambassador, Plymouth ambassadors, to, yes. uh, <laughs> ambassador to England and France. Yeah, uh, it's a fun video. Well, it, it it was a, a major concern. Like we cannot let them escape because yeah. there were great concerns in the north if they reach paris and london they could exert their influence and you know their yeah. orders from the senate and they're they're well known this this it was universally recognized it will be bad for the union yeah. if they get there it's much better for us to try to stop them so in October 1861, they're trying to get over there. And even though the blockade at this point is very porous, there's still no 
easy, simple way, especially when you're trying to play it safe. Yeah. So there was one steamer that was going to make the run, and everyone thought it was the Nashville. Everyone thought, oh, they're going to be on the Nashville. They're going to be there. And they decided not to take the Nashville. They decided to hold off and, and wait for the, another one. Took another route. They went to Cuba first. Um, and this is where we, good time as any, to introduce uh, Charles Wilkes. Mm. Who's a that's Indian. another name where, you know, at the time you would have known Wilkes if you were in naval circles. Because he has a, a reputation already. Well, he's like the great great grandson or the grand nephew of the Lord Mayor of London. Wow. From the 18th century. So there's a, a, a British connection yeah. with Wilkes, kind of ironic. Um, it's it's always he's... interesting how they want to have those those familiar connections, and they. Um, well, Wilkes they'll... was already famous at this point yeah. too. But they'll they'll often send. Uh, before I forget, they'll often send Louisianans to France, France. and you know, the, with their their cursory Creole French attempt to uh, stumble through. Yeah some some correspondence with the second french empire but uh yeah the wilkes name people, and he, people he was wilkes. very accomplished by this point um, he was raised by his aunt elizabeth seaton who is the the first roman catholic saint to be born in the united states in the americas i heard she was a saint yeah she was a saint literally yes. a saint um Entered the Navy um, and as a lieutenant, which is interesting, so as a naval lieutenant, which is 03, is given command of an Antarctic expedition of several ships. And in the late 1830s, early 1840s, uh, Wilkes circumnavigates the globe. It's the last circumnavigation of the globe purely by sail power. Wow. The last time. Uh, went to Antarctica, uh, all throughout the Pacific, um, set up a gravity measuring station on the top of the the big island of Hawaii, uh, wow. where all his sailors got frostbite because he made them march up and down. It's very cold up there. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, ended up in Fiji, and his a relative of his was killed in a dispute with the Fijians, and. So he retaliates and kills 80 of them. Uh, and Wilkes is also a, probably a product of his age, but an extremely hard disciplinary. And he's also very scientific. He's absolutely well-educated, uh, an expert in navigation. He's part of a number of uh, prominent societies, uh, scientific societies. So he knows seamanship he knows navigation he's a, a technically very competent person uh, and his report on his antarctic expedition uh, was enormous and very comprehensive but he's also a hard-nosed arrogant heavy-handed son of a gun he brought all of his officers up on charges during the course of his voyage around the world every single officer uh, and he was court-martialed, two court-martials at the end of his uh, voyage. The first was, uh, how did 80 Fijians happen to die? <laughs> and so he was acquitted of that, wow. but he was found guilty by court-martial of illegally punishing his men, like excessive punishments. Oh, okay. And he was punished for that by being promoted the very next year to commander. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Because of very Excellent. good order and discipline. So this is the kind of guy he is, uh, an a officer in the Treasury Department described him as being, uh, I'm trying to remember, I wrote it down as a matter of fact. He has a super abundance of self-esteem, a deficiency of judgment, he alone is right and all others are wrong so yep. this is this is captain charles wilkes who's the uh commanding officer of the uss san jacinto which is a fairly large steam-powered modern warship one of the uh, you know it, this, this was a good assignment so he made captain in 1855 
So this is in the small, fairly small U.S. Navy. This is like a plum of an assignment, uh, commanding a powerful modern frigate. And he was off the coast of Africa, um, trying to hunt down the commerce raider CSS Sumter. And then he catches wind as he's coming back across the Atlantic of Mason and Slidell trying to escape. And so he, uh, by reading newspapers, he realizes they're in Cuba and he knows the only way that they can get from Cuba out is through the Bahama Channel, which is about a 15 mile span uh, between the Great Bahamas Reef, which is treacherous, and Cuba. So 15 miles, you kind of have a really good chance of intercepting someone in only 15 sea miles. So he steams out there, and then sure enough, uh, Mason and Slidell boarded the Royal Mail Ship Trent in Cuba. And then they uh, leave Cuba, and they are intercepted by Wilkes and the San Jacinto on November 8th, 1861. So uh, when the, the ships approach, the Trent raises its colors first. Uh, so it is a Royal Mail ship, which is it's, it in itself is an interesting legal designation. So it's a, it's not a man of war, it's not a warship, but it is still a, uh, it's under the color of British government yeah. as being it's a ship carrying the royal mail. Yeah. So it throws up the British flag, which the the Captain Moore of the Trent thought, well, this is all. They probably think we might be Confederate, but once they see that we're British, they're going to leave us alone. Boom! Wilkes fires a shot across the bow of the Trent. Trent doesn't respond. They keep plowing forward and Wilkes fires a second shot narrowly across the bow with, you know, that's like the international <laughs> doesn't stop. Yeah. And the Trent is, is not a, an armed warship and it's up against the San Jacinto, one of the most powerful ships in the Union Navy. So it heaves to and Captain Wilkes, and this is my favorite part of the yeah. story, because uh, there's uh, a, a lieutenant named uh, Donald McNeil Fairfax. So he is uh, tasked to take armed cutters of sailors over to the Trent, and Captain Wilkes gives him written orders, not verbal orders. So in the 19th century context, if, you're, if you give someone a verbal order, like do this, and it's something kind of controversial or serious that could have negative consequences um, a lot of officers didn't want to take those kind of orders because at the end you could just be accused of well you just did that on your own i didn't tell you to do that and there's no evidence either way but wilkes gave him written orders which was a manner of saying this is what i want and i am assuming all responsibility for this i own this order I'm not gonna diesel my way out of it later if it blows up in my face. I am absolutely taking total full responsibility. Here's your order. And it says, go over, board the Trent by force. Search it from top to bottom and find Mason and Slidell, their secretaries, their baggage, any diplomatic bags, anything that could be contraband and take, and if they're there, if you go on board and there's Mason and Slidell and all their stuff, take the Trent as a prize. That was the legal order. Now, Lieutenant Fairfax, who, you know, would have been very familiar with Captain Wilkes and this, you know, overbearing, egotistical, uh, Lieutenant Fairfax, doesn't want to start a war. He understands the gravity of what's going on here, probably more so than others. Um, because Wilkes is only focused on, I gotta get Mason Slidell, we can't let them go. Um, the, the damage to the Union is gonna be too great. So Fairfax goes over and he alone boards, he 
the first thing he does, he disobeys Wilk's order to take the Trent basically by armed force. He leaves all of his weapons and armed sailors in the cutters. So he boards, he's met by Captain Moore, and he explains, I'm here to take Mason and Slidell. And Captain Moore says, no, you're not. And he says, well, yes, I am. And then so Mason and Slidell are there. So he sees them. There they are. Again, his orders are, if you see them, take the Trent as a prize. And by taking that as a prize, they would have brought it back to a prize court, which is the established international law. Uh, and then the court would decide what's contraband, what's not. And then if it's not contraband, the ship would be let go of it is contraband, whatever it is. It's, 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 there's a legal procedure for this. So Fairfax, very, uh, very kindly, again, he's trying on the, the British are outraged. Captain Moore is by all accounts, just apoplectic. Like this is piracy on the seas. Yeah. Stopping, you know, one of Her Majesty's royal mail ships to know what you're doing. Um, so Fairfax says, I request Mason and Slidell accompany me back. So again, he's trying not to say, I'm taking them by force. He's trying to say, Well, will they come with me so that I don't have to like literally draw a saber or a pistol and take them by force? And they, surprisingly, refuse to go voluntarily. So at this point, finally, Lieutenant Fairfax, and by the, possibly it was almost coming to blows. So he calls up some more of his armed sailors. So after all of this, he's trying to, he's escalating the force, like trying to keep things as, you know, uh, the least amount of force as possible finally brings on sailors and they take off Mason and Slidell. Um, but he also, Fairfax fails again to obey his order. He does not search the ship. Now, even if he had searched the ship, he probably wouldn't have found the diplomatic papers because the British illegally had put the Confederate diplomatic papers in a British government diplomatic bag, which is a big no-no. You're not supposed to do that. That technically violated British neutral. So you've got the US Navy boarding one of their ships, possibly violating British neutrality. And you got the British violating their own neutrality by saying, we're gonna hide the secret documents of a belligerent in our own diplomatic mailbag on board the ship. So at the same time, but uh, that only came out in the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, so no one knew that at the time, uh, outside of a handful of people in the, the British government. Uh, otherwise the Union would have been even angrier than they were. Yes. Uh, so they take Mason and Slidell off, and the Trent is allowed to proceed on its way. And so Lieutenant Fairfax did all of this, violated his orders in the, in an effort to avoid a, it's gonna be a diplomatic incident, yeah. but he wanted it to be as mild as possible so that when the Trent gets, the news gets back to England, it's, it's not these Americans scrambled on board with cutlasses and pistols and they grabbed people and dragged them off, kicking and screaming. It was, you know, an officer came aboard and was negotiating and explained, this is what needs to happen because these are my orders. But that's not how it came off in the newspapers. Oh, no. No. That's... <laughs> but at the end of the day, the Trent was not taken as a prize, no. and the ship was not searched, yet people were removed. So Lieutenant Fairfax, and so this is what happens when the Trent gets back to England, and there's this outcry the, the British government does a legal review and they conclude, well, it probably would have been legal for them to take the Trent as a prize and bring it back to a yes. prize court. But since they boarded, they removed people, didn't declare it as a prize and didn't, uh, and again, we're the, the, um, the Wilkes claim contraband. Mason and Slidell are physical embodiments. They're flesh and blood 
contraband, them themselves, not their papers, not their stuff. They constitute contraband. That's, that's very 1860s. Which is very unprecedented in terms of what contraband is. People generally haven't been contraband. So the, the British courts are saying this was illegal. Even though it was the lighter touch, even though the Trent was allowed to proceed, that was illegal. Taking someone off of a ship that wasn't declared a prize, uh, Fairfax did not see any actual contraband. He didn't see any diplomatic papers, dispatches, yeah. nothing that's materially helping the Confederacy. All he saw were two men and their secretaries and some of their family as well. Um, in fact, a lot of the, uh, the best accounts of the Trent Affair, the actual interception at sea comes from the family of Mason uh, or Slidell. I don't remember off the top of my head writing long after the fact about uh, what happened actually on the deck. Yeah. So poor Lieutenant Fairfax yeah, probably it's... should have just followed his orders because again, it, it wouldn't have been on his head. Captain Wilkes had taken full responsibility yeah. and then it, it the, the British would have been angry, but legally they would have been in a hard place because they would have, the price court would have found all the secret diplomatic documents of the Confederate government, which is contraband. So it's within the right of, again, you're a belligerent, you're at war, you've got stuff materially aiding your enemy on board the ship. As long as you take it to a prize court, the only thing that's going to be condemned is those papers and then the ship will be allowed to go. Yeah. So. Poor Lieutenant Fairfax made things worse, trying to make things better. Um, but this explodes in England, also explodes in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so we, there's three there's three things that we have to discuss. There's the American reaction and what's done with Mason and Slidell in America. There's the British reaction, and then there's the resolution. So where are they brought immediately after capture? I think it's Fort Warren. Yeah, I've actually I've been to Fort Warren in in, uh, in uh, Boston, and it's 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 not a nice place. Or at but least they, the... they were treated very well. <laughs> yeah, though. and in yeah. fact, they they even it's they were they were asked to sign a document stating how well they had been. Their experience treated. was much different than Confederate prisoners of war. Yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a small it's a. It's a large fort built on a small island in, uh, in Boston Harbor. Um, but Mason and Slidell are brought there, and then America celebrates. Yeah. The, United, the, the North celebrates, and while a lot of um, a people are cheering in the streets, a lot of people are nervous because they know the implications of it. Um, and one of the most important people that are very nervous about it is Charles Sumner, who is uh, very important in the, uh, not the backdoor dealings, but the, the, uh, the backdoor dealings between Britain and America. Um, you know, the, the famous of the caning of Charles Sumner. After that, he actually went on a, um, a tour of Britain, his, his self-imposed exile, and um, they treated him like a living martyr, that he had been came oh, yeah. for, he for the cause that of was one abolition. Hell of a beating. Yeah, but he was came <laughs> for the cause of abolition, and so he made a lot of friends there. And it's if if you read a lot of this is particularly in a world on fire, and I'll I'll, I'll talk more about a world on fire later. But he he strives for influence with Lincoln against Seward. And the title of A World on Fire is yes. from a Seward quote where he drunkenly at a party said, we will wrap the world in flames. And this is and the guy that they're dealing that too, with. Or who overheard it? Oh, Literally the, 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 worst, the person worst person to say be. something in a drunken stupor over. Is a reporter. Not just any reporter. The like, reporter, like the like, like Anderson Cooper of yeah. his day, or something. Yeah. You know, William, like, William Howard like Russell, Peter Jennings yeah. level of uh, yeah. And so he's like, oh, yeah, you're going to do what again? The war correspondent <laughs> who 
who Seward, uh, and, and this is and getting off the track, know, but Seward I, had bullied him. He had gone yeah. out of his way, because he didn't make any friends with his reporting on the war, uh, William Howard Russell, um, but Seward went and made sure that his pass was, was, had to be countersigned everywhere he went by the Secretary of State. <laughs> like, everything was, was uh, he was not friendly. But I have a theory. You have a theory? Tell me if you agree that the delay in communication between London and Washington was possibly one of the biggest things that prevented war, prevented escalation, because everyone could think things through in these two and a half week gaps. Because in 1858, there's the first transatlantic telegraph. You're gonna say and, like, that. Dee, yep. dee, 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 yep. and then it works for like a couple weeks. And then, and then some guy, a surgeon, for some reason they let a medical surgeon who's like, he tinkers with electronics. Yes. He's like, oh, I, I don't know tinker with it. He cranks the voltage all the way up yes. and he fries the cable. Yep. But there's no more transatlantic cable until after the Civil War. So it still takes two and a half weeks yeah. to get anything back and forth. And I've I seen think a that piece of time, that time, because if you want to say something, so you'll write something, or you're waiting for an answer, you have uh, you have weeks to sit down in your cabinet meetings the, and discuss, like, how is this going to be felt? You can consult with the fastest, ambassadors. The very fastest it could happen was seven days on a in a in a perfect world where because because they describe it in the world on fire amanda foreman talks about it with lord lyons that he could telegraph halifax halifax could send a very fast mail packet and if it had a good run it would be six or seven days to um one of the northern cities in england like liverpool mm -hmm. and they would telegraph london that's the in the in perfect conditions <laughs> you could do seven or eight days but the accepted standard was 12 to 15. so it's it's if, uh, if it was like cuban missile crisis level of instant communication yeah you might you might when people the like situation. seward are like no uh, if it was if it was direct communication with lincoln and russell maybe it might have been Maybe, or, but, but if it was, it, if it was, you know, Lincoln or, or, or Lincoln said, and Palmerston, at, at, in the midst of these discussions, supposedly said, you know, one war at a time. But he didn't say that on day one. Yeah. And so the the United States, the Union, is in a tricky spot. So it's still early days, Civil War, and they're uh, concerned that we, the, the Confederate rebellion is a rebellion, but we're still able to fight you if we need to. Absolutely. And so it's, it's sending, that we wanted to send a clear, unmistakable message that we will, you know, we, we won't be bullied, we won't be And threatened. in the American mythos, people even in 1860 even believe, they, they we whip you twice, we can whip you again. Yes, uh, that was, it was there, yeah, uh, and you can read it in these accounts because yeah. they bring it up. Well, well, we we beat them before, uh, and it, it it also speaks to it, it, and it puts. This is why I like having discussions like this because if you just read about it in a book, it tells you the facts. It doesn't put you in the context of what people were thinking. There were. Uh, prominent naval officers, military officers who firmly believed and were giving their advice to the cabinet and the president, we can fight the Confederates and the British at the same time. We can do it. Yeah. Um, I think, and this is, we'll get into this in our next video, I think they could have long term. It would have been ugly early on. Long term, they probably could have. But short term, it would have been really ugly with warriors steaming around. Yeah, I think problems. there's, a, we can get into that later, but I think it, there is a technological advantage 
that the British have in a, a, a manufacturing advantage that doesn't necess didn't necessarily exist in the previous two wars. Um, but that's a story for a different day. We, we, we're, we're charging ahead so on the track. track. Everyone's and celebrating the British in America. government goes, you need to apologize because you did this wrong. You silly Americans. And so two other characters we need to, to introduce. Well, three. Lord Palmerston is uh, the British Prime Minister. And Palmerston and Russell are kind of the original Gladstone and Disraeli. They're... Uh, oh, that makes sense to everyone. The, the, I mean, the, the, there, there are two... <laughs> the, a lot of times they're on the same side. It's not really Gladstone and Disraeli, but they're two prominent figures in British politics that orbit each other. And sometimes oh, yeah. Russell's the PM, alternate. sometimes uh, Palmerston's the PM. Until and, Salisbury. And so uh, Palmerston is the PM and Lord Russell is the Foreign Secretary. And um, the other two people I wanted to mention is Lord Lyons, um, who is the, uh, the British minister in Washington. And Charles Francis Adams is the American minister in London, and of course he's the, the grandson of John Adams, the son of John Quincy Adams, and I think it's always funny that, that he, the grandson of John Adams, met with the, grand, the granddaughter of George III, you know, and they're, they're all traveling in the same circles, you know, 100 years later. Um, but Lord Lyons, I, I really like to talk about Lord Lyons, because he's just, such a weird guy. No. He's such a weird guy. I always, I'm always drawn to these weird characters, these eccentrics. Um, and I, I really encourage people to read A World on Fire, but they, they go into him in depth um, in World on Fire, and he talks about um, how he knew his servants' shoes better than their faces. He's always just looking down doesn't really get along with very many people, isn't a conversationalist, just kind of keeps to himself. But he ends up, at first he, he does not have a good relationship with Seward. But eventually he, people do. But eventually he does, and they actually have this weird friendship, and that friendship will be key in giving the United States a little more time to uh, uh, to discuss things, so they demand an apology and the release. Yeah, so they that's that's what it comes to. Um, there's two things that they there's there's two things that I wanted to talk about. Um, there's an immediate move by the government to halt. Um, so while they're demanding these apologies, while they're they're figuring out what they're going to do. They do two things without, without, uh, without delay. They send troops. They send the first troops. Mm -hmm. And they halt a lot of shipments. There's an export ban. And they specifically ban a huge shipment of saltpeter. And they are of the opinion, as are a lot of Americans, that Britain could have shut down northern gunpowder production overnight mm. no neutrality you know yeah. it, it's it's I, we, I, we, I, I, we've I talked about it previously where your foreign um you know components of of gunpowder can be very influential you know it, we talked about this in the chilean civil war but i i you know it could have obviously america would have found another source but it would have been a um, a short-term problem, less convenient because yeah. a, a ship with a bunch of it in in the hold, yeah, is uh, a lot better than and some saltpeter cave somewhere in Western Virginia. And the 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 abundance of of um, northern logistics, I think, is one of the huge huge things that makes the Union successful. So it's that would have been a would have been a major uh, thorn in at least the ordnance corps side. Yeah. Um, well, 
but uh, so anyway, the they halt shipments on that, among other things. Um, they send troops to Canada. The first troops, which are actually Canada, was woefully, and and they take stock of what's there, and they and the Canadian militia and volunteers are are such small numbers, just and so woefully equipped. Yeah. Um, I think most people are just going to assume, and most people at the time assumed, if the Americans attack Canada, they're going to roll into Canada. Um, and so the British opinion at the time was, if they're going to put troops in Canada, they will be a first strike. Um, from what I've read, that it, they would move into Maine, attempt to take Portland, um, and then it would mostly be a naval naval campaign but that's that's for for the next day um i i think one of the interesting things to mention too is that it's a cunard steamer that uh, brings a lot of the troops and the great eastern you know, actually else brings. they sent to canada who did they send in the to canada? winter of 61 62 a particular person who we've spoken about before who did they send sent Lane Fox. Oh. Old Pitt Rivers. Pitt the Rivers. My Musketry, favorite name. The, formerly the chief instructor of the School of Musketry at Hyde sent him to Canada to give a crash, not a crash course, but a refresher. So that means every one of those muskets are going to be used effectively instead yeah. of it just being. So a, that, that puts you, but. A context like that, it puts you in the mentality of the British government that these guys might be in battle soon. We've got, and they've all been through the annual course of musketry. And to use a disgustingly modern term, I would call him a like force multiplier. In oh, a way. yeah, no, the a, a sixteen thousand British troops trained to the the height standard of musketry in 1862 against the New York State Militia yeah. is, is, is or the main almost guard. incomparable. Yeah. And so they sent Lane Fox over to, to give everyone, so go, go pull out the yeah. Red Book again and yeah. go through all your musketry drills. Yeah. So it, it, it that just speaks and to the context of what they're planning. You so don't send Lane Fox over here if you don't, Anticipate yeah. we're gonna need yeah. <laughs> musketry. So they they the the cabinet is discussing things, but while they're discussing things, they are sending troops. They are cutting off supplies, and the public opinion is ab there is a fervor. Uh, yeah. There are Confederate flags being waved in the streets. Uh, there are songs being written, um, and where previously you know public opinion swayed one way or the and the other. Um, a lot of people were very much pro-union. You know, a lot of the lower classes especially were were very, uh, they saw the South as the, the, the holdout of slavery in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but for this time, in December 61, everyone is, you know, the, 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 the war fever is, is taking over. And one of the things that I wanted to, to mention with war fever that goes across classes is Milne, who's the commander of the British fleet um, in the Atlantic at the time, his account says the lower decks were have draped, uh, con was decorated with Confederate colors, and that, that everyone was talking about there would soon be war, and they're on the side of the South, at least among the, the lower decks. But uh, the, the, there was a uh, communication that went out to the Navy that, that they were to be prepared. Um, they were getting ready. Um, so the nitty-gritty of the, the demands, initially they are very, they're, they're stringent. They need an apology. It needs to be a actually a meaningful apology. They need to return Mason and Slidell. Um, I don't remember if there are any other terms that you remember in the initial thing. But it gets approved by the cabinet, um, and, and even the cabinet is mad. Palmerston, who had been previously 
waffling about it, apparently threw his hat on the table and said, I won't stand for this. And they're, they're, they're all getting wrapped up in it. But, and this is, this is, uh, um, you know, proves the, the necessity of monarchy. It gets sent to um, Queen Victoria, who um, every, Prince Albert does everything for her. Um, at that point had kind of taken over the role of um, doing her boxes. And Prince Albert was sick. He was uh, had uh, typhoid and he would eventually die that December. Um, but one of the last things he did was review this case and write to Palmerston and say, temper your words. And he wanted to make sure that the gist of the argument of the, the letter that went out says, we couldn't possibly believe that this, that you intend to injure the, you know, the flag of, of Great Britain. We want to believe that this isn't an act of war on your part. We will consider it an act of war if you don't return these people. But, um, you know, it's, it's a mistake. Let's just, let's just talk this out. Um, and I think that letter from Prince Albert actually demonstrates that that you need a monarch. Oh, no, no, no. That, yeah, it absolutely demonstrates that you need a monarch, but it absolutely demonstrates that there was a tempering force um, on, on the cabinet's decision because without that. Well, and and imagine know, if there was a telegram. Instruction. And oh, yeah. Before, with, before Albert could have. Though, though I think they would have had to run it by Her Majesty before they sent the telegraph, but um, they, uh, uh, there was that tempering, and they, it got sent, and then it goes to Lord Lyons, and Lord Lyons meets with Seward and says, I'm not giving you this thing, but this is what it says, and I will give it to you in two days. And then he waits an additional two days, but he gives him this thing and says, you have seven days. But he actually basically gave him double um, by, the, by the time everything's sorted uh, because of this relationship that they had built. But, but Lord Lyons was also instructed that if you don't get the answer we want, go, you were to Go leave. to Canada. <laughs> so it is, which, which means we're yeah. severing diplomatic relations. Yeah. So we're yeah. recalling our ambassador. Yeah. It was... Know, it was a tempered message, but everyone knew this can end in war if you don't. Yeah, it's, if you it's don't for all watch that, your words. I, I think ultimatum is too hard yeah. of a term, but it was very close. It, 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 had, it, it had the same force as yeah. an ultimatum. And the, the Lincoln cabinet discusses it, and they are worried that even if they... Um, you know, make the right move in their eyes that the British might still be offended and still consider it a declaration of war. So they, they very much are treading lightly, but they want to appear that they're not. And there's still, there's this public opinion yes. thing that all the democracies have yes. to worry about. So all the people think Mason and Slidell being captured are the greatest thing. Mitch McConnell. Now I was... Uh, Listened to several podcasts and, and read several things. Uh, Can't trust. I've I've heard repeatedly some surprisingly uh, what I would consider competent historians praise Seward's diplomatic genius, and they use those words at like solving the Trent affair, and I don't see that at all. No. Like, uh, the, the only thing you could possibly say in, is, is the weasel-worded way he wrote the letter back, yeah. the apology that was a non-apology, but still the, it was good enough that they yeah. interpreted it as apology. That's not diplomatic genius. That's just, it, or maybe it is. Maybe that just, is just, diplomatic. There are some people that think that he was blustery on the outside, because he was an old school politician where he could say one thing in one town, drive 
20 miles down the road and say something else. We're going to light the world on fire. He, We're very he, sorry. He got in trouble for that in the, in the, uh, um, in the 1860 election. He was talking about invading Canada. And it got in the newspapers. And then when he goes and travels in, uh, in Britain, they're like, well, well um, oh, that was just a rural uh, campaign speech. Yeah. Uh, that, was, that was different. So there are people that believe that he was this, you know, evil genius that, that said one thing and meant another. Very well accomplished he, historians. I, call Seward him. is an interesting person, yeah. but I, I think he was. Uh, I think he, out of his depth with yeah. Uh, this was, Trent. and um, I think some people might go. This was a diplomatic thing. We owe it all to the Secretary of State, but it's not. It, it, it from from what I've read. And I've read as much as I can about this one little portion and uh, one little time in history. Um, it comes down to not Seward, to everyone else that's I, yeah, telling well, Lincoln, watch your words. Prince, Prince Albert and Lincoln. And it's kind of a, the, the, you know, one war at a time has become, you know, it's a, yeah. a, a Lincoln quip or one of his little yeah. comedy you know the things that he was well known for but still a pragmatic policy and that was his guidance to his cabinet yeah we're gonna fight one war at a time calm this thing down and the same the same with uh, uh prince albert in england i i don't i don't see much diplomatic genius <laughs> from seward yeah, uh, and it's it, it, they do talk about that also in World on Fire. How they talk about uh, Sumner talks with Lincoln and gets him to um, agree to release Mason and Slidell. But they but play they it off. Word it, yeah, they play it off as like, oh, these Mason and Slidell were they're minor functionaries. We don't really yeah, care yeah, about and them. The, not a big deal. Um, Oh, those, those guys. Oh no, we didn't yeah, really. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. You know, we can have those back. They're they're of no consequence yeah. to anyone. So, the uh, in the meantime, though, tro more troops are sent. It's uh, people wait that with bated breath. No, I, I think at the peak there were still fewer than twenty thousand British troops. Yeah, it's it's between twenty and thirty thousand and there's it's one artillery big. battery. Yeah, that's not good. It's big. uh and and the big thing though is that the Navy is on uh is is watching, is is preparing for war. And I think that's probably more important yeah. than the than the army because they assume Canada you cannot defend that big of a border. But you can put pressure on the U.S. by invading a state. Uh, but that's that's for next episode. So, did they apologize? They apologized. Did they let sort of. It was, it's, this, it's this weasel worded, not apology sort of apology. We regret the circumstances yes. that led. We're to sorry the... that you're sorry, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's it's one of those not not apologies. But um, they um, do send that. Lyons accepts it and sends it back, and, and it sort of dies down. Um, and then Mason and Slidell go to England and France, <laughs> and then they both declare their support for the Confederacy, and the Confederacy wins the Civil War and is now a that modern, happened. prosperous that country. Happened. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, Mason and Slidell are equally, uh, they're, they're not as obtuse. But they're, they're but they are they are not successful. Ineffective. They are not successful, and uh, um, that's the, you might the, as well have just let them go. I, 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 I know, I know, because it's the they always make the worst moves in for in the diplomatic circles. But it, it's what fascinates me about the Trent affair is we, the U.S. and Britain came not super close to war. Like it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't like shots were about to be getting fired, yeah. but all of all of those dominoes that would have needed to fall for that to happen, they were in place. Like the board was already set, so to speak. Yeah. And if a couple things had gone slightly different, those dominoes could have 
easily fallen. And it's yeah. not, it is definitely not outside the pale that uh, they could have. And that's why, again, I, I think my theory is that if they had a transatlantic telegraph where things, decisions could be made in the height of passion. More insults could be sent. Yes. That's <laughs> you great. You goon. Yes. But, uh, oh, big tobacco spitting goon. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> the, yeah, there, 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 um, there could have been an incident. It's not implausible. Um, and then, even though it might not have been a War of 1812 invasion from two sides, they very much could have given more men and material to the Confederacy. They could have made things very difficult. So the biggest, I would argue, the biggest harm to the North would have been the, the stopping of British uh, arms and supplies yeah. coming yeah. in because we, we often think about the British as suppliers to the Confederacy. Well, they were selling just as, they sold more infields to the North. Yeah. So, and then they all would have stopped and then they stuff. all would have gone to the South yeah. because again, the South is buying and, uh, but Northern grain goes out to Britain. Oh, so Northern yeah. meat goes out to Britain. There's, there's a lot of interconnected stuff with the, uh, with the economy and economic historians have been talking about that a lot more. It's going to be a fun video to do the third Anglo-American War. Third Anglo-American War. But, uh, what, it, what it might have looked like because it didn't happen, unfortunately. We, we weren't able to kick your butts a third time. Wow. Yes. So any other insights on the Trent Affair? Um, no, but I'm... Lieutenant Fairfax is one of those, like, well-intentioned characters of history. Because if it just went to the prize court, it would have been a different situation. I think it would have. Would have I think he might have got laughed out of the prize court. I think, I think a prize court might not have. No, I think the prize court would have found diplomatic, official government. But they would have said. These people are not contraband. No, but their documents and stuff are. They were carrying yeah. official letters of introduction yeah. and a, you know, a bunch of other things that could, in the price court, definitely have been argued. This is material to help a belligerent enemy of the United States. Therefore, um, all of that stuff is contraband. And then, the but then did, the, did the San Jacinto have the right to stop you know, Her Majesty's Royal Mail Steamer. Depends on who you ask. Depends on who you ask. So yeah, it's 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 a fascinating part of history. Both countries got absolutely incensed and ready for war. And, and I'm still mad. You should be. <laughs> still mad. I can't believe they sent those diplomats. Um, but it's a uh, it's it's an interesting time. I think we should invade Canada right now. We should. So, that was the Trent Affair. Um, let us know what you think in the comments. What could have happened? Did um, America come that close to war with Great Britain? And until the next time... Good night. Is, is, that, our new, is that our new catchphrase? Good night? Good night? I don't, I don't think so. Good evening? Good morning! Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Good, good morning. Come on. I'm drunk. <laughs>